Shalom. Today we're going to have a bird's eye view of the Israelite camp in the wilderness. I used to think that the camp looked like this. Of course, the Levites and the tabernacle are in the middle, and then everybody else is just sort of spread all the way around. And then many years ago, I was actually in a bagel shop in Baltimore, and there was kind of a lithographic print. It wasn't this print, but it did show that the camp was in this order. In other words, what was north was north, and what was south was south, and the corners were open. And this gave me a new view of what this should look like. So in Numbers 2, we find out that this is how the tribes are camped around the tabernacle and the Levites in the wilderness. Some of the drawings of this show the different tribes camped behind each other rather than next to each other. That isn't really clear. I think in terms of peeling out for warfare, which is what is described here, I think it's more clear when the next group will go if they're side by side, but it really doesn't matter. They could have been one behind the other. So I went back and gathered all the numbers of all the tribes, and then I added up the ones that were on each side. And so it becomes clear that, that the north and south side are approximately the same in number, but the east side is larger and the west side is the smallest. You can excuse my very poor graphic skills. I have tried to show the relative size in these drawings. The ultimate layout will depend on the size of the allotment for the tabernacle and the Levites, which is not named. So if it's a long oblong thing, then you would get this shape and the north and south kind of stubby. But a lot of drawings will show a very small block in the middle there. And then you have obviously this very cross-like picture that can be seen from the air. And a lot of people have taught about that. Here's an example. And here you see that the tribes are parked behind each other. This picture is oriented towards the west. As you can see at the top, there is a little arrow. It says west. Beyond that, each tribe had a flag. And here I have set the flags of the leading tribe from each group. So for Judah, of course, we have the lion. For Reuben, I have chosen this picture, and we'll see why I chose all these pictures. The Reuben is a man. His name is Behold a Son. We'll go over the scriptures for why I have chosen these pictures. On the short side, you have the tribes that are with Ephraim. I've chosen the bull for that. And finally, Dan, who is the eagle holding a snake. And if you research different websites which give the flags. You will see many different groupings. Judah is almost always a lion. In the websites, you won't, you won't often see Ephraim. What you will see instead is a picture for Joseph. And Dan can be a snake or it can be an eagle. So we'll see how that all comes together. So concerning Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you should not excel because you went up to your father's bed when you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Of course, Judah, no problem. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son, you are gone up. He stooped down, couched as a lion as an old lion who shall rouse him. So this connects Reuben with the water. Reuben is also connected in the story with the mandrakes, which are named such in English because they look like little people. These are some real pictures of mandrake roots. Concerning Dan, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that bites the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backward. I have waited for your salvation, Yehovah. So clearly the serpent is here. And also the salvation of Yehovah, who we know is Yeshua. We'll get to why those go together shortly. Now these have been the prophecies of Jacob over his sons. For Joseph, we have to go to Deuteronomy when Moses makes a prophecy and he says his, that is Joseph's glory, is like the firstling of his bullock and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. So this is how Ephraim becomes associated with the bullock. In another scripture, in Hosea 10:11, it says, And Ephraim is as a heifer that is taught and loves to tread out the corn, but I passed over upon her fair neck. I will make Ephraim to ride, Judah to plow, and Jacob shall break his clods. So it's another association. Now from an 11th century commentary, 
on numbers. This was written. There were insignias on each banner. The sages said that Reuben's banner had the picture of a man placed on the mandrakes, as we talked about. Yehuda's banner had a lion, to which he was compared by Yaakov, by Jacob in the prophecy. Ephraim had a picture of an ox based on the firstborn ox, which we read from Moses' prophecy. And Dan's banner had a picture of an eagle until they resembled the cherubs seen by the prophet Yehezkel, which is Ezekiel. And here we see a rendering of this commentary. We see that Ephraim is the bull, that Reuben is represented as a man, Judah, of course, is the lion, and Dan is shown as the eagle. Now, I've talked a lot about the constellations in the zodiac before, and what we find is that each one of these four insignias, representations on the flag, is at a quarterly spot in the sky. Now, this is from the synagogue at Beit Alpha. It's a third century mosaic in a synagogue. I talked about that more in the calendar videos. The arrow points to the lamb, to Aries. Moving up, the next thing is the bull. Moving two over, we find the lion. Moving over two more, we find the scorpion. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then finally, in the lower right-hand corner, this is what's called in Hebrew the bucket. It is what we would call Aquarius, a man with the water. So these pretty much line up except for the scorpion, which is in the place of Dan, the eagle with the snake. Now there is a man in the sky who is wrestling with a snake, and his name is Ophiuchus, and he is the serpent holder, the snake handler, and his foot actually is resting on Scorpio. So these two signs in the sky overlap. They both are on the ecliptic and there are astrologers who say that Ophiuchus is the 13th of the zodiac signs on the ecliptic. Usually there are only 12 but he is added. And this is the picture of the salvation, the man who is wrestling the snake He's also stepping on the head of the scorpion, as was prophesied in Genesis. Here's another picture of that. Maybe you can see it a little better. The man stepping on the scorpion. You can see that both of their figures overlap on the actual ecliptic. Neither one of them is solidly on it the way the other signs are. Now, this is the sign for the month of Cheshvan, or Mar Cheshvan, and this explanation is from Chabad. This month, which is associated with Scorpio, is the second month of the Jewish calendar, counting from Rosh Hashanah as they count it, which is the first month called Tishrei, or the eighth month from Nisan, the spring, when we count the calendar. Cheshvan is the only month that does not have any holidays or special mitzvot. We are taught that it is reserved for the time of Messiah, who will inaugurate the third temple in the month of Cheshvan, so that's kind of interesting, even though we have this toxic figure of Scorpio, we see in the sky there is a man stepping on his head. And that man from the prophecy of Dan, who is like a snake, but also within that prophecy, we are waiting for the salvation. Messiah is inferred in that prophecy. Of course, Messiah is from the tribe of Judah. I'm not implying that he is coming from the tribe of Dan. So there's another place where we see these four figures, and that is around the throne of God, as testified by Ezekiel in chapter 1, verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. So here is somebody's representation of that. Here are a few more representations coming from Ezekiel chapter 10. And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face was the face of a man. The third face was the face of a lion. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. So here the cherub is listed instead of the ox. And one speculation about that is that the angle from which Ezekiel was looking was that he could see those three faces, but the four faces altogether make up the cherub. So he just cites the cherub and then he cites the three faces that he could see. Some interesting drawings here about that. And then also in Revelation, we see the same thing. And the first beast was like a lion and the second beast like a calf 
and the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And here's somebody's interesting interpretation of the view of the throne room. In Matthew 6.10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. And on earth, the Father provided us four witnesses, the four gospel writers, that represent exactly these same four figures. Matthew represents Yeshua as the Lion of Judah. Mark represents him as a servant, as an obedient worker on behalf of the people. Luke, the doctor, represents him as a man. And in John, we see that Yeshua sees things from a heavenly perspective, from above, and he is the one who overcomes the serpent. Until next time, Tasimata Inayim al Hashemayim, keep your eyes on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.